This meeting is being recorded. Okay. Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Carr and I'm Chief Knowledge Broker for Octo Open Communications for the Ocean. And we're very pleased you could be with us today for our webinar um, on an innovative toolkit for MPA managers for developing MPA resilience or manage management, MPAs coping with rapid changes. Um, before I turn it over to today's presenters. I wanted to let you know that um, you can ask questions in two ways. You can send them through the question panel, um, it, which is in your user interface. And if you just have a, a question for us, that's actually the easiest way for us to see it. So we'd encourage that. Um, but we also have the chat where you can chat with, you can choose to chat with just um, the panelists and myself or uh, with everyone. And so we encourage you to share information that's relevant to this topic on in the chat. Um, we ask that you just keep it on the topic. Um, but this is another way you can um, ask questions if you want it to be asked of the audit of the other other um, participants in today's webinar in addition to the panelists, um, or if you wanted to share information about work that is going on in your own area or additional information that you know about. Um, so we encourage you to use both the questions and the chat. Um, so I'd like to get started by um, introducing Jean-Jacques Goussard with the Ocean Governance Project. Um, and he is going to be introducing all of today's panelists and giving um, the introduction. Welcome, Jean-Jacques. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, my name is Jean-Jacques Boussard, and I'm in uh, coordinating this uh, resilience partnership. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, our panelist, uh, panelist Mathieu Ducro. Mathieu Ducro is uh, is uh, responsible of the Resilience African uh, platform, and uh, is working also with. Uh, uh, West, Amer West African uh, Marine Policy Area Network. And uh, Mathieu will take the floor to talk about uh, his uh, operation in Senegal. After Mathieu, we have uh, Mai De Luca. Mai De Luca is manager of the Jacques Cousteau Estuarine Research Reserve. And Mai De Luca is working with us uh, many years ago. <laughs> and has been contributing a lot to the developments and achievements we will present. Uh, Liliane, Liliane Vezel is from Brazil, uh, and uh, she is especially working with us for the engagement of uh, managers to, to use uh, the tools, the resilient self-assessment tool. Rachel Filos is uh, working relatively closely geographically with Mike because she's uh, in, the, in the state of Delaware in uh, the USA and she's managing uh, another Australian research reserve, the Chesapeake uh, Research Reserve. Uh, Colonel Mamadou Sidibe is the director of uh, Community-Based Marine Policy Areas Directorate in Senegal. And uh, this uh, marine uh, priority area directorate is developing a very innovative approach of community-based management and with very interesting results. Rodrigo Lozano from uh, Colombia is managing the Gorgona National Park. And uh, we have been in touch recently during the months of uh, June. Uh, to just be working on the on the resilient self-assessment tool. I think I'm not forgetting other panelists. Bon, we will have other speakers. Uh, Liz Angela from Brazil. She's not. Liz Angela is not. She's not here. Uh, still I trying hope that, to connect. Still trying to okay, connect. exactly. I know that uh, there are some uh, connection issues in this area, in the area she, she is. Uh, Liz Angela is uh, from Brazil. She's managing uh, an important extractive reserve uh, at the mouth of the Amazon River in uh, Brazilian Amazonia. Uh, Ricardo, Ricardo uh, is not here because uh, Ricardo was not available finally, but he sent us a video and we will uh, use this video. And after we have uh, Regis de Pinto Lima. Regis de Pinto Lima is Brazilian and uh, he's a uh, manager of, an, of an, another important marine protected area in the state of Rio de Janeiro, near the, the town of Paraty. 
Mr. Kanté. Kanté is not uh, connected. Mathieu, trying is uh, maybe he's still trying to. No, connect. I just send a message to Sarah in the chat because uh, I mean Kanté has not received the connection code. Mr. Lamine Conte is is a that of uh, one of the more uh, ancient uh, uh, community-based marine protected area in Senegal. And we have been uh, doing uh, great work with, uh, with this reserve. And uh, he will uh, explain a little bit uh, what are the achievements and the results. OK. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe, uh, Sarah, we, we, we should start. We could start. Um, certainly. Wait, what um, does Lillian want to share the PowerPoint? Can I share the screen then? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Good, thank you very much. So uh, the objective of this uh, webinar is to share, share with the audience and the participants uh, some lessons learned after being working uh, more or less three years with the resilient self-assessment tool. So we will present uh, very briefly uh, the history of the Resilience Partnership, but very briefly, because it is not uh, the objective, the main topic we have to address. And after that, we will uh, share some results very briefly to keep time for the, uh, to save time for the other speakers. And we will share some lessons learned. And after that, uh, all the participants, the, the panelists, will share with you their experience uh, working with, uh, with ERSAT. Next, Lilian. Well, uh, the Resilience Partnership is part of the Ocean Governance Project. It's a wide project working, uh, at the beginning we were working in the Atlantic, but now this project is also working in the Coral Triangle in uh, Southeast Asia with uh, different components. And uh, one of these components has been developing uh, a tool uh, quite similar to Resilient Self-Assessment Tool to assess the quality of management of MPAs regarding uh, the conservation of marine mammals. Next. So we will uh, talk a little bit about uh, our objective. Next. We're just two here, strange. Yes. So one fact is that uh, change are accelerating on the coast and in the marine environment for more than one or two decades or more. And uh, this acceleration is now challenging, clearly challenging our ability to adapt and our management practice, which are sometimes marked by a certain inertia and a lack of foresight. That means that the change happened more fast than many times that we are able to adapt and to cope with this change. The Resilience Partnership has been launched in uh, 2016, between 2016 and 2017, by the EU Transatlantic MPA Network Project. And this project has been completed in uh, 2019. We started with uh, 11 initial MPA partners uh, from Brazil, from Gabon, from Mexico, from Portugal, from Senegal, and from USA. These partners were uh, selected uh, based on the good practice they have been developing regarding the resilience to, to improve the resilience of the MPAs. So the aim of this group was to share experience, group, good practice, tools, approach, but also issues related to the strategies that are implemented by MPAs to cope with rapidly changing environment, but not only, also the approaches developed by MPAs to contribute to the resilience of surrounding coastal zones. 
that means that it is not only resilience of MPAs, but how MPAs can contribute to the resilience, to improve the resilience of coastal, uh, of coastal zone. Next. So coping with rapid change, rapid change ha have a lot of uh, origin and causes. Uh, it can be uh, climate change, but uh, many times in emerging country, urban sprawl is and uh, weakness in land use planning are the main cause of, uh, of rapid change. Also rapid development, coastal erosion, speculation on coastal lands, and there, there is a very long list of uh, of uh, facts that uh, show that these changes are really accelerating. So in conclusion, the management of MPAs must be adapted and it's important to be able to build on good practice, such as anticipation of change, forward planning and management, institutional resilience. We will talk about uh, these different good practice uh, later. The partnership has two main objective. The first one is to provide MPA managers with tools and especially the resilient self-assessment tool uh, that we have been developing with this group. The objective of this tool is to assess and monitor MPA's resilience-oriented management capacity or resilience-based manage based management capacity. The second point is to, to contribute to open the mind of the managers, taking into account key factors that are generally not considered in management effectiveness existing frameworks. And uh, developing the tool, and before to start the development of this tool, we have been doing an assessment, a review of the main existing uh, tools or frameworks to, to evaluate management effectiveness. And clearly some of the criteria we will uh, present are not included into this tool. So that means that ERSAT is clearly complementary with existing uh, management effectiveness framework. Uh, the last objective is to contribute to the improvement of MPA management plan in order to provide guidance to reinforce resilience capacity. Next. So we have been working since uh, 2017 with a lot of uh, workshops in different regions with our partners, exchanging information, exchanging approach, uh, participating to international events, uh, in, such as uh, the last uh, uh, World, World Conservation Congress, but also the first uh, African Parks Congress, Impact Five uh, and the first, uh, the second uh, Asia Park Congress and other events. So it has been very, very uh, interesting to exchange and to uh, and to share uh, ideas, approach, and uh, with a, a very uh, diversified panel of people. Next, so now we will talk about the resilience toolkit. Next. The first element of this toolkit is clearly the resilience web platform you can access online, where you have uh, some uh, information on uh, scientific papers, publication, resilience good practice. We have uh, seven until nine good practice that have been described, some resilience FEQ. And an, an access to uh, the online and offline Excel resilient self assessment tool. Uh, next, this resilience platform uh, have been uh, serving uh, 30, 300 uh, distinct hosts in, during the last two years. And, uh, and uh, we, have been, uh, <laughs> we have been observing a very rapid growth of the frequentation during the months of August, and we cannot explain why, <laughs> but it, it was very interesting. Here you see uh, the countries uh, from where uh, the users are connected or have been connected. Next. 
the tool is uh, there are different components. The main component is uh, a form, and this form is available online on the platform, but also is available on uh, Excel because it's better to work on Excel because uh, sometimes the connections, internet connection uh, uh, cut, he, he, you lose the data, so it's better to work on Excel and after that to input the data into the form on the platform. Uh, the, the user decide if the data can be saved on the platform, so they can be retrieved and compared using uh, the, the tool on the web, web platform. It's very useful because uh, first, we can retrieve the data. Second, you can compare two assessments from one year to another year or between two MPAs. Uh, there is a uh, possibility to export uh, raw data from the online platform. Uh, every uh, assessment has a unique ID. Uh, generally, we recommend that the management committee, the members of the management of the reserve or marine protected area management committees and stakeholders would be involved during the assessment. It's really more more, uh, it provides more benefits. By the end of one assessment, uh, based on the graphic and the interpretation of the, of the graph, it's possible to, uh, to provide some recommendation and to build a roadmap to apply this recommendation, a simple roadmap. And generally, we will see some examples. We will uh, learn uh, from some examples where very simple recommendation have been generating uh, real benefits. Uh, we are engaged in a lessons learned process, uh, which is ongoing, and we will deliver some uh, first findings from this uh, process. Next. So, ERSAT uh, is uh, the resilience assessment criteria, uh, and the resilience guidelines and the tool have been developed from a detailed analysis of partner good practice and success factors for building resilience. I was uh, mentioning the good practice of our partners who have been analyzing in depth this good practice in order to understand, to understand uh, what are the benefits and how it's possible to build on this, uh, on, on this good practice. Second, we have been uh, conducting an in-depth review of scientific literature and as I said before, a detailed analysis of how resilience is taken into account into existing MPA management effectiveness framework. Finally, as the tool is available to work with uh, since 2021, we got uh, many feedbacks from the managers using uh, the tools. So these feedbacks uh, allow to improve the tools or improve the forms in some times. Uh, this tool is primarily intended for MPA managers. It is a tool for managers. It is based on uh, five sets of thematic criteria. The first one is anticipation, awareness, and preparation. The second is the territorial integration of MPA. The third is the social and cultural integration of the MPA. After political support and institutional resilience, and uh, after that, the knowledge management and know how. Uh, here you see uh, one example of the graphic with a comparison of uh, two assessments. And uh, the toolkit includes also uh, ERSA tutorial. It's a tutorial that explains for every question of the form. Uh, the interpretation of this question and uh, the meaning of, of some uh, expressions, some words, uh, resilience if you frequent ask questions, and a description of uh, a detailed description of some good practice. Next. So what are our criteria? We have, uh, as I said, five families of criteria, and we have 16 criteria. And uh, in, in, in red, you see the criteria that are clearly, uh, clearly uh, innovative. 
uh, especially uh, anticipation, uh, preparedness and recovery capacities, and uh, the capitalization and lessons learned ability. The other criteria that are in blue or in gray uh, are more common, and you can find it in many uh, existing uh, package for duration of management effectiveness. So we will talk later more on this criteria. Next. Recently, to date, we have been completing 78 MPA resilience assessments. Uh, we have been developing, developing training of trainers. Uh, we had a training of trainers in Senegal with uh, 15 managers. We have been working in the US with uh, uh, colleagues of Mike from the Estuarian Research Reserve Network. Uh, we have been working in Brazil with ICMBO, a very interesting training. And it, this training was attended by the new responsible of the risk at the level of the central institute, federal institution ICMBO. And we have been working uh, recently in Colombia with uh, the National Direction of National Parks. And after, uh, during the months, at the beginning of October, we will have a last uh, training of trainers in Mexico with the uh, National Council for Protected Areas. So we have 30, 134 manage, MPA manager trained. But uh, if we consider that for many assessments, uh, the stakeholders and the, and the members of the management committees of the protected areas have been involved. So we have many more people that have finally that have been in some way trained using this, uh, this tool. Uh, we, we have been working in uh, 17 countries. Uh, below you see an extract of the database uh, and the manager, every manager can retrieve their data from this database online. Next. We have been developing uh, resilience with the help of uh, Octo, a resilience community of users. Uh, until now, we have 215 members, uh, 14 members. Uh, it's clear that uh, we would like to, to improve the dynamic of this uh, community of users. Next. So some lessons learned. It's clear for practically all the, almost all the managers we have been working with that AirSat is a user-friendly, cost-effective, and fast tool adapted to assess the quality of MPA management to cope with rapid change. One assessment, the duration of one assessment is between one and three hours, three hours. So that means that it's possible to repeat the assessment, for example, yearly. And uh, it really, it is repeating the assessment that allow for the manager to estimate and to evaluate clearly the progress and uh, the evolution of the context also. From the feedback from users, uh, first AirSat uh, broadens the scope of management efficiency to account for resilience-oriented management through innovative criteria. These innovative criteria, as I said, are really new in the world of the conservation. Anticipation is not really uh, uh, not really used as a, as a key, key uh, criteria, and it's very interesting at the moment where the change are accelerating. This tool has proven to be very useful for the preparation and evaluation of MPA management plans. We have been contributing in diverse countries, in Senegal, in France, and in other countries, uh, and in, uh, in Gorgona, in Colombia now. Uh, we have been contributing to the update of, of management plans. Uh, also, the guided practice of resilience assessments provides opportunity for debate on innovative question issues between the staff of the MPA, but also the members of management committee and stakeholders. One of our colleagues said that it's really needed to socialize the assessment exercise involving management councils. It's really 
through because we have seen uh, attending uh, this uh, assessment sessions that the the conversation and the and the debate uh, is really interesting and it's also uh, for the for the staff of the MPA it's possible to get more confidence from the stakeholders because the stakeholders see that the manager of the MPA involves them into the discussion on the management and it's really a guarantee of confidence. It also establishes the law to establish a baseline on resilience-oriented management to measure progress. Next. If the assessment involves local actors and stakeholders, uh, this tool will allow to improve the dia dialogue and confidence between MPA managers and local actors. So this tool is able to improve co-management dynamic. And finally, the identification of shared weakness or strengths between different MPAs, which are working with uh, an umbrella institution, it can suggest some in umbrella institution management improvements. We have seen in some cases that some weakness were shared by diverse MPA, uh, regardless where they are located and other. And, uh, Discussing with the managers, finally, we saw that there were some uh, progress needed from the management of the umbrella institution. And it's quite interesting also to use all the assessment for one country, for example, uh, and uh, to examine what are the shared strengths and shared weakness. So ERSAT can be applied to the OECM. We have never been trying it, but uh, it must work, and a strong protection zone uh, in, uh, in MPAs. Next. We have been processing and starting the pro to process the data. And uh, we have some criteria with uh, some scores that are generally very low regardless the country, regardless, really generally very low. It is uh, on, on capacity of anticipation and capacity to build lessons learned, to develop lessons learned, and also preparedness. Uh, it shows that preparedness in countries that are affected sometimes by cyclone or exceptional events, preparedness is better, for sure. But uh, in, uh, in some area, preparedness is really, in many area, preparedness is really very low. And uh, regarding taking into consideration the acceleration of the change and uh, of exceptional events, it's really necessary to improve this uh, level of preparedness. The, the higher score uh, are for internal zoning of the MPA. Uh, partnership and formalization of the partnership. Generally, uh, we were one hypothesis was that this criteria will collect uh, would collect uh, low score, but finally, finally, not uh, the score are, are not so bad. And also for territorial integration and secure land tenure, uh, the score are more or less uh, high. So. There is a need of simple guidelines for anticipation, how to build a participative scenario with the stakeholders and to draw up some scenario for the future that the community will be able to evaluate one year or two years or five years after in order to, to um, update this scenario. And also uh, lessons learned methodology because the lessons learned is very low, it's very important to be able to, to take stock of the experience of the past, to, uh, and it's necessary to, to provide some methodology, because if not, uh, it never happened. Uh, we have been processing the data by uh, uh, principal component analysis, and after that, we have been uh, doing a cluster analysis between the different criteria. And it's relatively interesting to, to, to see that uh, vigilance and awareness is uh, 
more or less linked with knowledge management. Well, it can uh, it can seem obvious, but uh, not so obvious. And there is a kind in some MPA a kind of curiosity that makes that uh, uh, the people is more vigilant, more aware, and uh, try to collect information. Uh, and it's it's interesting. It's also interesting to see that the capacity of anticipation is in some way linked with the level of, invo of involvement of the manager in local decisions, of the management, the staff of the MPA in local decisions. That means that uh, the fact to, that the staff of the MPA is working with local actors and, uh, and is involved in decision-making mechanism at the local level improves their capacity to anticipate uh, and to build some scenario. Well, this, no, 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 uh, thank you. Uh, also, we have a, a close link between the political support and the institutional resilience. Well, also, this one seems obvious. And it's interesting also to see the relation we have between uh, capacity to build lessons learned and restoration now also with the interaction with stakeholders. Here, uh, we have seen that uh, when uh, uh, the, ma the management of the MPA undertake restoration operation, they are really committed to monitor the results and uh, to take stock of the experience uh, and, so, and to develop lessons learned. So it's interesting to see that uh, the restoration activities can uh, impulse uh, a better effort or a bigger effort on uh, to develop lessons learned. Secure and tenure is not really connected with other criteria, but now with the formulation of partner, the formalization of partnerships is clearly related to partnership, the ability to develop uh, partnerships. And the management responsiveness or responsiveness of the management of the MPA is linked with the territorial integration. Thank you. Next. We can see it's possible we have been uh, we have been preparing a typology of the patterns of the main graph of the patterns in five families. Uh, but this typology is not really uh, finished, achieved. So we can just look at some examples. Here, uh, clearly, all these examples are anonymous, as all the process of the data is anonymous. We don't use the name of the MPA or the country or nothing like this. Uh, our our uh, interest is more to understand the relation between the criteria and uh, how to improve the tool to express better uh, good management in relation to resilience. This MPA is uh, an MPA which benefits from a very strong support, uh, political and institutional, from the umbrella administration. And uh, we see that all the south part, the south hemisphere of the graph, is really more developed than the north hemisphere. And uh, it reflects uh, a kind of vertical management. And we have been, uh, we have been uh, facing this kind of uh, findings, this kind of uh, pattern in some cases. And generally, it is the same, the same situation with a strong umbrella administration, uh, a lot of facilities for the management of the MPA, but a very vertical management. and. This, this uh, form of this kind of management is not open to, uh, to uh, new concepts or, uh, or new approaches based on the anticipation, the responsiveness, preparedness. It is one family. Second. Next. Here, uh, Mr. Lamine Conte is a manager for this MPA, is not uh, anonymous. Is a manager of uh, one MPA, uh, which have been uh, implementing ERSAT assessment two years consecutive, two consecutive years. 
one year and after this year, 18 months after another assessment. And here you can see a comparison of the two assessments. So when we saw this comparison, all the people said, but, but what happened? It's so different in 18 months. But in reality, when the manager explained, uh, it happened a very important change in this territory due to the construction of a big bridge that, that opens up part of the MPA. And you see the bridge at left. And it's very interesting because uh, it changed a lot of things in 18 months in the, in the, the environment of this MPA. And uh, the ERSAT result reflects very well this, uh, this change. Next. It is a very nice uh, pattern and a very complete pattern. But we have to say that also it comes from a very mat mature marine park. Uh, and uh, this marine park uh, call us to, to contribute to the update of their management plan. And uh, it's a very complete pattern and it is really a significant uh, characteristic of well-established marine parks co-managed by stakeholders. Uh, in, uh, it is a very ancient, very old marine park working with the fishers very closely and with all the local government and, and national government in this country. And uh, it's a very uh, good management in relation with resilience. Next. It is a specific case. It is an insular marine and coastal protected area that has been created and which is co-managed by uh, fishers. So that means that the fishers are at the creation, at the origin of the MPA, and still they are really managing the MPA. And uh, it's, so it is a management which is oriented to sustainable fisheries activities, essentially. We have seen the same pattern, it is in Brazil, this one, and we have seen the south of Brazil, and we have seen the same patterns with other two other reserves that are managed, created, and managed by fishers. So it's a specific uh, characteristic patterns of, uh, of uh, uh, reserves created by fishers and managed by fishers. Next. So I would like, before to, to close this, this intervention, I would like to uh, mention uh, the WCC 2020 resolution, which is the resolution 030, on coastal resilience. And this, because this resolution has been proposed by the government of Senegal, uh, we have been contributing to uh, the preparation of this resolution. It has been voted at 93 or 94%, uh, and uh, it recommends to incorporate resilience into management plan and management effectiveness evaluation process. Next. Uh, ERSAT has been uh, recently included into the climate change resilience and adaptation planning tool uh, that has been developed by the IUCN, WCPA, and the NOAA. Uh, it is a CCRAPT tool. Uh, and uh, also, we are working with the uh, IMET, uh, Integrated Management Effectiveness Tool. And we are in discussion to contribute to, to the update of the criteria of the Green List, of the IUCN Green List. Next. So thank you very much. And uh, I hope that uh, I was relatively brief and uh, we will give the floor to our panelists. Thank you very much. Um, we're still waiting for Commandant Conte to enter. Um, I've had communications with him, and I think he's going to register as a regular attendee, and then we can promote him. But I still don't see him. So would it be possible to move on to the next panelist? Uh, yes, I would like to take advantage of this moment to present, uh, to present one of the panelists, Liz Angela. Lisangela Cassiano, and she was uh, absent uh, before. Uh, Lisangela is working, as I said, in uh, Brazilian Amazonia, the mouth of the Amazon, in, an in the Sur Extractive Reserve. Thank you very much. 
uh, I will give the floor to Mathieu, Mathieu Ducrot. Yes, here I am. Hello to everyone. And thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share uh, my experience about ERSAT and, and the potential gains and benefits that we can record quite quickly from its use. Um, I might be one of the persons uh, on this planet <laughs> who has been using uh, quite often ERSAT as I've been the animator of more than 20 evaluations. Uh, so far, I'm part of the initial partners, first in Gabon and now in Western Africa for the West African Rain Protected Areas Network and also as a, a technical assistant in the direction of community-based MPAs of Senegal. Um, so maybe uh, I don't want to take the floor too long because Jean-Jacques has been saying uh, a lot of things already, but what is very interesting to, to understand is that ERSAT is truly actually something different from the usual management effectiveness um, uh, evaluation tools, uh, the IMED, MED, RAPAM, or scorecard, or other tools that uh, we have been studying, analyzing, and we generally don't take in consideration too much the question of resilience. So ERSAT is absolutely complementary and coming with uh, different perspectives and, and, and a piece of analysis. Um, what is interesting when you are organizing uh, an assessment is that uh, the participant uh, will be discussing around concepts and questions that they generally don't address. Uh, such as anticipation, uh, the difference between a threat that will be identified while updating the management plan and the risk that can be developing and that can be uh, suffered by, by an area uh, from this threat. The, the fact of turning the analysis of the identified threat as potential and probable risk and to analyze this uh, to, to analyze the severity of the risk and the capacity to to, um, to 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 develop a response is something that is generally not done uh, through a, a usual management effectiveness uh, assessment tool and there are questions very simple about preparedness to a shock to a hazard that are generally not addressed like for example, the fact of uh, having a good insurance uh, for the for the material, the cars, the boats, uh, is something that we generally don't study, and it's something um, underlining some weaknesses that uh, that were not obvious before, especially in developing countries, where the the, the preparation to potential potential shocks is uh, is generally very low. Um, there are other notions that are very interesting, like, for example, the idea of the social recognition of the importance of an MPA at the heritage level and socioeconomic level. Uh, the fact that an MPA is part of the values of a, a community and a municipality is generally something that uh, was not addressed before. And it led to... Uh, several times very important uh, results, like you will see uh, with the uh, Commandant Lamine Kanté in Bamboum, with new types of collaborations and investments of the municipalities in the in the MPAs. Um, I could note also some unexpected results in Gabon, uh, where together with Jean-Jacques years ago, we developed a, a prospective territorial survey showing where are the main hotspots and where will be the main hotspots and the main shocks between the urban sprawl and, and, and the concert areas. Uh, and this led the Ministry of Habitat and Urbanization to require our data um, to, to update the, the long-term management plan of the urban development around Libreville, the capital city of the, of the country. This is clearly showing that this kind of evaluation can lead to new considerations and open 
the eyes to not only the NPA managers, but also other stakeholders who can uh, contribute and participate to, to common jobs, to common analysis surveys and, and to common evaluations. This is certainly one important point to keep in mind. And this is why I would highly recommend that even though maybe it's useful to have the first evaluation done only with the, the management team uh, in order to understand how it works, it's generally more useful to have uh, a large participation of the stakeholders, the, the local government, the municipality, the, the stakeholders, and finally, the representatives of all the constituency around the MPA, because it's bringing uh, new opportunities of partnership and, and the notion of, for example, formalization and value of the formalization of the commitment of the different stakeholders is something that can lead some changes and development of, of new uh, new agreements that will contribute strengthening the position of the the MPA in its uh, in its region or in in its uh, um, geography. Um, mm, it's also very important to have during the assessment uh, the directorate, the direction of the line managers of the of the MPA manager to to participate. Uh, I've seen in several occasions that important decisions were taken at the at the national level, like for example in Comoros Islands, where the director of the of the agency in charge of protected areas has been attending several assessments and he has taken immediate decisions uh, in order to to solve some of the problem that can't be solved at the at the MPA level but uh, has to be considered uh, the response has been has to be considered at the regulatory level for example or at the, the, the legal level uh, this is also the case for Senegal and um, and the direction of the community-based MPAs who attended in several opportunities uh, the, the MPA asset assessments uh, decided to integrate the tool uh, at the national level and to make it something mandatory for all the managers. And now it turned uh, one of the official tools for the management of the national MPA network. But Colonel CDB will yeah. develop much more on, on this point. So these are maybe some important findings that I wanted to share with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mathieu. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, I see that uh, Lamine Kanté, I think he was not able to connect. So we will uh, give the floor to Mai De Luca uh, from the Jacques Cousteau National Australian Research Reserve in New Jersey. Mike. Yep. Thank you, Jean-Jacques. So again, I'm the manager of the Cousteau Reserve, uh, which is part of a, a national network of 30 um, marine and coastal protected uh, areas. And I've been involved with the project since the get-go. And so I'll just mention a few of the applications that uh, certainly are highly relevant to the reserve system, but have broader application you know, to um, uh, marine and coastal protected areas you know, throughout the, uh, throughout the, the, the world. So Jean-Jacques mentioned one of these already, and that's um, management plans. Every five years, uh, each of the 30 reserves has to update uh, its management plan. This is a uh, partnership um, funded by the federal government, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and the uh, um, uh, coastal states or universities are, are the, uh, the other partners. So um, the RSAT tool can be very helpful in um, identifying actions that can be taken um, or addressed in a management plan to enhance the resilience of, uh, of an estuarine research reserve. So that's one of the, uh, the key uh, applications that um, uh, you know, provides some very useful um, tools you know, for uh, MPA managers. The second area that um, I believe the RSAT tool is very helpful for is actually through the designation process. It takes quite a bit of time to establish an estuarine research reserve as it does for many MPAs on the order of four to five years. 
And in that process, an applicant has to evaluate uh, uh, several sites uh, for uh, designation. And the RSAT tool can be very helpful in um, evaluating the resilience of one site versus another. So um, site selection is another, another application of the, uh, the RSAT tool. And then yet another application is with boundaries. You know, we're all experiencing um, impacts of climate change on um, marine and coastal protected areas. Sea level rise is one of the key, key stressors that's uh, impacting the uh, resilience of um, estuarine research uh, reserves. So the RSAT tool can actually be helpful in identifying uh, lands that can be acquired to uh, address some of these uh, impacts of, uh, of climate, climate change, particularly with respect to, to sea level uh, rise. And related to that, many estuarine research reserves have marshes as one of their key or critical habitats. These habitats are particularly susceptible to rising uh, sea levels. And so the RSAT tool can be uh, used to help identify corridors that marshes can mig migrate uh, into. Again, related to uh, land acquisition or boundary expansion or boundary modification of existing uh, marine and coastal uh, protected uh, area. And then finally, I'll mention that uh, some of the, the stressors that we're, we're seeing uh, certainly um, impact beyond the boundaries of an individual marine or coastal protected uh, area. One example I can give you is we're seeing rain shifts in organisms and uh, habitats uh, because of warming uh, seawaters and other environmental changes related to uh, climate change. So the RSAT tool can be used um, uh, collaboratively with partners, with other M marine and coastal protected area managers to address some of these impacts that go beyond uh, uh, boundaries. So regional approaches to um, enhance resilience of uh, the integrity of some of these uh, protected areas uh, is yet another application. And then finally, I'll just mention that uh, one of our uh, partners, and Jean-Jacques may address this a little bit later, one of our partners, Rafaela Leguvelo, has been developing another application of the RSAT tool related to aquaculture and how shellfish aquaculture in particular can enhance the resilience of marine and coastal protected uh, areas. So that's in development and hopefully should be uh, available soon. So those are just a few um, applications that uh, I've identified and experienced through my association with the, uh, uh, the team here. And um, uh, hopefully it can be uh, helpful to others uh, as well. So thank you very much, Jean-Jacques. Thank you very much, uh, Mike, for this interesting point. Uh, we, we, Lamine, Mr. Conte, Lamine Conte from Senegal was connected and he's has been disconnecting and maybe he will come back. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, uh, I, we will give the floor to Rachel Philos. Excellent. Rachel, Rachel is uh, from uh, the Chesapeake uh, Estuary Research Reserve. Rachel. Uh, Delaware, uh, Delaware National Estuary Research Reserve. Yeah, Delaware and the Chesapeake. Delaware, Delaware, excuse me. No problem. Thank you all so much for allowing me this opportunity to share my experience um, during our training session that we had. I actually went through this recently in April, um, and it was it was pretty eye opening. I must say, uh, Matthew and Michael have already touched on a few of the key points that I kind of want to reiterate a little bit, um, but for for me in particular, I became a manager of the reserve in 2019, at the end of 2019. So I'm fairly new to the role. And a lot of time what I experience as a manager is reaction. I am reactive to problems. I handle things as they come up. I don't often have the ability to take time and be proactive and think long-term planning. As Mike mentioned, the reserve system does require us to have five-year management plans. And right in the very beginning of my time as a manager, I wrote one of our updates for that. So that was helpful. But 
for us, using the RSAT tool, the resilient self-assessment tool, it allowed me to think of resilience in a different way. For our community um, along the mid-Atlantic coast of the U.S., we often think of resilience in the terms of infrastructure, of our buildings, of our facilities. Will a storm come and take out our power system? Will it take out the actual buildings themselves? We don't, I don't always think of resilience in the terms of political support. Um, lessons learned was a new one that I had never thought of before. It wasn't something that, you know, we do things in a reactive manner. Are we writing it down? Are we recording it? Are we passing those lessons along and learning from them? So taking the time to sit down and work through this tool was very beneficial in that manner. Um, boundary encroachment, things like that. We had considered, we were like, oh yes, we need to go put a sign up there, but what is the actual impact to our MPA if we are not thinking about that, if we are not addressing that. Um, one of the other key things that I took away from the training, um, I attended it. I was fairly new in the role, but I had been there about three years, three and a half years at the time that I took the training, but I attended it with a staff member who was brand new. And I know we say that this tool is for managers, but as Matthew mentioned, expanding who's taking it and who is using this tool, I think was going to be very beneficial. Um, she took the assessment with me and between the two of us, she was asking questions, looking at it from a fresh perspective that I had never thought of. Um, to me, it was just kind of common knowledge or maybe it just existed in my brain. Um, but she was asking questions that were just different. And so one of the future applications that I want to do with this tool is I want to take it again, the assessment, I want to do it again in a year. And I also want members of my, my team, my research team, my education team, my stewardship team to also take it. Because seeing what their perspectives are, not just the management perspective, not just outside stakeholders, but seeing what the internal perspective is of our resilience and also allowing them to be proactive and looking at our facility and our MPA with the, the different um, areas, you know, anticipation, awareness. I think that that'll be helpful for them and also for me and the results. Um, being able to do the tool repeatedly is also really nice because you can hopefully see a change over time that's improving your resilience. Um, and the other key factor that we have, as Mike noted, our reserves. Um, there are 30 of us. Our, I'm going to use the word reserve and MPA interchangeably. Our reserves, there are 30 of us and several of us, including our reserve, have multiple components. So we have land MPAs, protected areas in different areas of our state. So I have two different reserve components. So when we were going through the assessment and we were really thinking about it, we were actually coming up with different answers for the two different locations. So what I would like to do and I plan on doing is actually thinking solely about one location versus the other one and doing two different assessments and then being able to, like uh, Jean-Jacques showed you, you can overlay those results and see what the differences are in different areas. Um, so those are some of the key takeaways I took. And again, I appreciate everyone's time today. Many thanks, uh, Rachel. Thank you very much. Uh, I see that uh, the Commandant Lamine Kanté uh, from Senegal, from the Bambung uh, Community Based Marine Protected Area, is here. So uh, I would like to, to give the floor to the, to the Commandant Lamine Kanté. Hello, bonsoir. Ma Ma Mathieu will uh, translate. Uh, Ok, merci. Bonsoir à tous. Donc, je suis vraiment content de, de participer à cette importante rencontre en ligne. 
et de partager vraiment notre expérience sur l'utilisation de l'outil AirSAP, qui a été d'une grande utilité, parce qu'on l'a utilisé à deux reprises, d'abord en, en 2021, en mars 2021 et en décembre 2022. Et pour, pour résumer, les, les, les conclusions qu'on a retenues de, de, cette, de cette évaluation, vraiment sur euh, le diagnostic et la résilience, la capacité de résilience de l'air marine protégé pour l'implication des communautés, a révélé qu'il y avait une faible implication de la commune, parce qu'il faut noter que l'AMP de Bambou est une, une AMP à des échelons communautaires, comme tous les AMP du Sénégal et qu'il fait partie des, des premiers AMP qui ont été créés euh, dans, au niveau du Sénégal. Et que, euh, une des faiblesses de la gestion était que la commune, la commune euh, était faiblement représentée dans, dans, dans la gestion. Et lors de notre dernière évaluation, il y avait une décision forte et vraiment qui a, qui a impacté euh, la coordination de l'ensemble des, des parties prenantes dans la gestion de cette AMP, c'était que la commune de, de, de Touba Kota, vraiment, qui, qui, qui joue un rôle très important sur le développement socio-économique, a décidé d'appuyer l'AMP par la, par la construction de huit cases hein, pour euh, appuyer les communautés vraiment à mieux s'approprier des, des principes de gestion communautaire vraiment d'être plus résilient face au, au choc qu'ils peuvent, parce qu'avec la pandémie, il s'est avéré que beaucoup, de, beaucoup de, de, de personnes de la population qui, qui travaillent dans l'AMP avaient perdu le, le, le travail. Et que, comment l'AMP peut faire face à certes, ces situations, des situations de ce genre Et c'est pourquoi euh, la commune avait pris cette, cette décision, vraiment d'investir. Euh, dans l'AMP pour mieux appuyer les populations, appuyer l'AMP à mieux préserver l'écosystème de mangrove. Donc, il faut noter que, aussi, on a noté que euh, AirSAP est, 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 est accessible et qu'on s'est très vite approprié de cet outil, vraiment pour euh, l'utiliser nous-mêmes chaque année pour, pour, pour prendre des décisions majeures, des gestions. Donc, euh, euh, il faut noter, on a noté que les, les résultats ont été à, à plusieurs niveaux très bénéfiques pour euh, euh, améliorer notre, notre niveau de gestion. Donc, c'est cette expérience que, que, que j'ai voulu partager et vraiment, je remercie tout le monde et vraiment, je m'excuse sur les problèmes de connexion que, qui ont causé que je me suis tardivement voilà, mis en ligne pour pouvoir partager voilà, cette expérience de l'utilisation de l'outil AirSAP. Donc, vraiment, avec l'autorisation de notre direction, euh, AirSAP fait intégralement partie de, de nos outils de gestion voilà, hein, pour améliorer l'efficacité de gestion des aires marines protégées. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much, uh, Lamine. Uh, we'll try to translate this uh, this rich contribution. So, uh, Commandant Lamine Kanté is the conservator of one of the first marine protected areas of uh, Senegal, uh, which was created in 2004 uh, in the inland waters of the estuary of the Sin Salum region. It's a World Heritage Site, Reserve of Biosphere. And Bambung is uh, one of the first community-based MPA, which was created uh, since the beginning with the intention of developing ecotourism. And uh, an investment was made in the early uh, years of uh, the existence of the MPA to develop um, a community-managed uh, ecology in the MPA in order to produce um revenues and contribute to the long-term funding of the of the mpa surveillance system so um lamin said that he, he used two times ersat uh, first one was in march 2021 and the second one in december 2022 um and The utilization of ERSAT led to many discussions between the different partners and stakeholders around the MPA 
particularly the municipality of Tubacuta, uh, which is a very small city. We are in a rural area. But this uh, municipality is well known for tourism, and there are several hotels and um, and and uh, restaurants and and there are possibilities to to visit the mangrove areas in in canoes and and, and, and touristic services like this, which had all been suffering very much from the COVID crisis. So while using the ESAT. Uh, the, the representatives of the municipality who attended the, the evaluation got to realize that they were not using sufficiently the existence of the MPA and that it was not correctly valorized for the economic development uh, uh, in the region. And so the municipality, who is not very rich, decided to take on its own budget to co-invest together with the, the MPA in the ecology in order to restore it, to, to build eight new uh, small houses and to, to redevelop and communicate on the attractivity of the bamboo ecology uh, in order to contribute to relaunching the, the touristic activities after the COVID crisis. And so this has been a very important uh, achievement, a very good result. Um, it was like an immediate benefit of using AirSat um, and now the the partnership is much more strong, and uh, and the new the new touristic camp is being built at the moment, uh, with very big expectations uh, from all the local community to get benefit from this new attractivity, and the relaunching of the the the, the touristic sector, which is benefiting to everyone in 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 this small city, transporters common sense, uh, hotels, restaurants, and, and, and touristic guides. So uh, Lamine is saying that he's very happy with this tool, uh, which is very easy to use and which is fully appropriated by the management team now. They decided to use it yearly, and they know that they will, they will get more benefit from using ESAT along the time. So this is what he wanted to, to share with you. Thank you very much. So, Commandant Lamine Kanté, thank you very much, and thank you very much to Mathieu for the very good translation. So, we will uh, give the floor to Lilian. Lilian. Lilian Wetzel. Thank you. You're, you're mute. Lilian, you're Lilian. mute. Okay, yes. Hello everyone, thanks for, for allowing me to be here. And um, I'm really glad I have been working with this team for the past three years in the project. And um, lately we have been working together very closely on the dissemination of our set. And I'll just show you very quickly what we have been doing, what our methodological steps for that. So um, we have been approaching, mostly we start with an institutional approach and that means we approach governments and NGOs. The governments, because they are in charge of uh, direct management of those areas, the protected areas, and uh, also uh, involved in the creation and mostly execution of public policies related to the, um, to the building of, um, to, to the development of uh, resilience in those areas. NGOs are not directly involved in the, in the directly involved in management of those areas, but they do put pressure for MPA creation. Um, they also influence public policies somehow, and uh, mostly they are part of management committees or councils in many cases. So they are involved in management of those areas. And in addition to the institutional level, we also work at the personal level because sometimes we, we are approached by people, by people who learn about the project, they're interested in the project and they want to know more about it. Um, so we have a four step methodology of um, involvement and engagement of people in the process. Our first level is introduction. So we, we offer webinars, introductory webinars to people who are interested interested uh, in the project. Uh, then we may have a second level where we develop criteria deeper and explain the criteria in detail for people uh, that are learning how to use and apply the tool. 
we may offer also we may also offer some guidance, direct guidance to people who uh, are not very feeling very sure on how to apply with their management committees or with their team. So we are also there for them in case they need a step by step uh, help. And uh, lately, as Jean Jacques has said, we have been developing some coaching sessions, some um, trainings uh, where we train people, managers mostly to be managers, uh, to be trainers of other managers in the process. So they learn how to apply the tool uh, for their areas. They train their colleagues in the same area, but they're also able to train other colleagues in charge of managing other areas. And we have been doing that mostly at the national levels in different countries, uh, but also at the um, MPAs that are managed at the state level. For example, in Brazil, we have been involving some managers who are in charge of uh, MPAs that are created and managed at lower levels of the federation. With that, we are working for the development of awareness of uh, managers really in, in relation to this theme of uh, resilience um, development within their areas and also for their community and the surroundings of those areas and helping them uh, to, um, in the process of decision making to develop um, uh, decisions and take decisions that um, are capable of guiding actions, real actions and effective actions when it comes to the development and building resilience in those areas. So that's the process we have been developing. And um, please, uh, we are also open to uh, anyone from related uh, professions. As Jean-Jacques said, mostly we work with MPA managers. The tool has been developed for that, but um, people from other areas, related areas may also be interested um, in that. So please feel free to contact us if you need further detail or further information on how to apply the tool. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lilian. Uh, thank you very much. I will... Uh, Ricardo was... Uh, Ricardo is the manager of the Fernando de Noronha uh, Marine Poetry Area in uh, Brazil. Uh, but Ricardo was not able, was not available for this uh, webinar, but he sent to us a video and for technical reasons, uh, we don't see the picture of this video, but uh, uh, I will uh, I will launch the video. You can hear the message of uh, Ricardo, and uh, Lilian will uh, translate after. It's a short message of two minutes, and Lilian will translate uh, this message after. Tudo bom, pessoal? Muito agradecido pelo convite. Aqui, Ricardo Araújo, do Parque Nacional Marinho Fernando de Noronha, que é uma ilha né, localizada no mar continental do Brasil. Então, minha, minha nossa ideia aqui, né, vou apresentar um pouco só da ideia que a gente teve de trabalhar as mesmas questões que a gente estava trabalhando no seminário, é que a gente acaba fazendo uma coisa, é, um trabalho com o nosso viés, né? o nosso nossa visão pessoal. Então, uma das ideias que a gente teve foi de trazer esse, um, um questionário né? e comparar também, fazer ele de uma forma coletiva, com o grupo de gestão ou com o conselho da unidade. Né? Porque aí a ideia é que a gente consiga, então, também a avaliação que existe do gestor, mas poder comparar ela e fazer ela também em conjunto com outros atores. E pode ser só o grupo de gestão, a própria unidade, porque aí você tem uma visão um pouco mais voltada para a gestão, ou pode ser também é, um trabalho feito com o conselho gestor, porque aí você vai ter vários atores, né, vários stakeholders ali da região, que trabalham, que influenciam e que são influenciados pela gestão da unidade, estão podendo ter uma visão também é, diferenciada, né? porque às vezes a visão do gestor, ou a visão de quem está ali fazendo o trabalho, é, tem um certo viés, né? o viés de quem está atuando, e às vezes a gente deixa alguns pontos cegos, algumas ideias diferentes, para é, que a gente às vezes não consegue visualizar de uma forma boa, e aí de repente quando a gente traz um grupo maior para fazer uma discussão um pouco mais aprofundada sobre um, um item ou outro item, 
a gente consegue ter ali uma, é, outras versões da realidade que não só aquela que a gente acredita. Então, eu acredito que essa diferença, né, esse olhar diferente dos diferentes entes, pode ajudar muito também na questão da gente ver pontos cegos, visualizar questões de gestão importante. Estamos agradecidos pelo convite e nos vemos em breve. Ok. So, uh, Ricardo uh, is uh, Ricardo Araújo's manager of the Fernando de Noronha National Park, that's an island in the Brazilian um, uh, continental seas. And um, he was talking about an idea he had during the, the training we had in, in Victoria in uh, Brazil this year, uh, where he thought of, uh, in addition to applying himself the tool, uh, he decided to replicate it with his colleagues in the, um, the management team, and then further with the uh, management uh, council that they have there so that um, he, he understands that opening this process to a wider audience, he could collect extra information and additional points of view, uh, things that would uh, really enlarge the, um, the perception of reality, bring other points that uh, usually they're blind to, we are blind to them and um, so that uh, this could enrich the process and uh, understand other visions of the reality in the surrounding area as well. Thank you very much to, to Ricardo and to uh, Liliane for the translation. Now it's uh, another short video, but it is in English. Uh, it is uh, the, he is uh, Regis Pinto de Lima manager of a reserve in the state of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gaius Pinto Lima. I work in the Chico Mendes Institute for Biodiversity Conservation, commanding the Tamuz Ecological Station, Marine Protect Areas, uh, in, in the Grand Pro, the soft state of Rio de Janeiro state. Uh, I have uh, extensive uh, experience in marine protected areas management and in those species conservation projects and coastal management. The coastal and marine zone is on the place, is a perceptor of the climate change, either by the erosion of beaches, uh, fluids, and landslides in urban areas, or even by the emergence in the island countries. In Brazil, approximately 60% of the coast uh, is in the erosion process, and the effect of the fluids and landslides have increased every year uh, with alarming economic and social uh, consequences. There is an urgent uh, need to prepare coastal municipality in communities for this global confrontation. In this sense, um, I believe that uh, I was sad too. Uh, has the potential to promote dialogue and between uh, different actors with a focus on identifying the resilience of the coastal territory, especially in protected areas. Uh, to this end, uh, the knowledge already produced in each of the protected areas, whether scientific or traditional knowledge, as well as in their surrounding areas, Organize and, and, and move at available uh, by the RSA tool, uh, provide managers with analysis of the resilience that is an important indicator for the integration necessary to minimize uh, the effect of climate change and the coastal zones. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Regis. Uh... I will give the floor to Lisangela Cassiano from Brazil, from ICMBO. ICMBO is the Chico Mendes Institute for Marine uh, for Cooperated Areas. Lisangela, please. Uh, olá. Eu sou a Lisangela Cassiano, analista ambiental do ICMBio. E eu estou lotada numa unidade de conservação, né, uma área marinha protegida, e fica bem... Né, localizada na, na foz do rio Amazonas, né, no encontro do Amazonas com, com o Oceano Atlântico. 
uma área bem sensível e muito biodiversa. E a gente está acostumado a fazer é, avaliação da gestão, mas essa, essa proposta né, da parceria, ela, vem, ela é bem diferenciada porque ela tira o, o, o foco da gestão local e ela passa a, a, nos, a fazer o olhar dessa unidade como fazendo parte de um todo. E aí ela nos propõe a antecipar problemas também, a, a ver os problemas né, de forma antecipada, saber se a gente tem recursos, se a gente tem planejamento, se a gente tem é, parcerias para enfrentar essas mudanças é, é, climáticas, né, crises globais. Então, a gente gostou muito porque a gente começa a se preparar melhor para o futuro. Em vez de ficar só apagando fogo, né, a gente começa a olhar, ter uma visão de futuro e, e se antecipar esses problemas que, porventura, vierem a acontecer. E sem tirar, sem tirar essa avaliação da gestão, mas a gente também consegue é, ver se a gente tem parceiros, se a gente tem recurso, e isso faz com que a gente acabe, é, essa rede acaba fortalecendo a gestão local também, e a gente começa também a pensar que pode também é, ser útil para as outras marinha, áreas marinhas protegidas é, que fazem parte dessa, dessa parceria. É isso, obrigada também. Pela, pelo convite de fazer parte. Muito obrigado, Lisangela. Uh, maybe, uh, Liliane, uh, yes. could you Yes. Lisangela is also a manager at the federal level in Brazil, uh, and her MPA is located at the mouth of the Amazon River, where it encounter, encounters the... Um, Uh, the Atlantic Sea. So she was talking about um, how usually um, they do, have, they are very used to doing evaluation of management, but um, usually only looking at the local, uh, uh, as a local approach. And now through this tool, uh, she began to look at it from a larger perspective. And then uh, beginning uh, uh, to consider is, uh, her MPA is part of a larger scenario with other MPAs, Uh, in continuous exchange as well, and especially learning how to anticipate problems, because usually, she says, she she was used, and most, most uh, managers uh, in Brazil say they are used to extinguishing fire, and uh, this time she learned to to look at um, uh, how, uh, at uh, the potential partners, resources, everything that was needed in order to face possible future scenarios. So uh, in this way, she considers this as being very positive uh, and helping her um, amplify this network of MPAs and then consider the exchanges and potential positive uh, inputs from one MPA to the other within the partnership. Thank you very much, uh, Lilian. I will give the floor to Rodrigo Lozano from Colombia, from the Gorgona National Park. Rodrigo. Ah, there is one. Hola, buenos días. Ok. Hola. Ok. Buenos días, Rodrigo. Eh, yo soy Rodrigo Lozano Osoy. Soy profesional de monitoreo e investigación del Parque Nacional Natural Gorgona. Nosotros recibimos la capacitación eh, en el mes de junio. Eh, y. Eh, En el marco de la actualización del plan de manejo del Parque Nacional para una vigencia del 2023 al 2027, en el marco de esta actualización, eh... disculpa. Parece que hay problemas de, de conexión. Hola. Digo, sí, sí, te escuchamos por momentos. Hello. Um, perhaps it would be better to just uh, talk into the microphone directly. Rodrigo? ¿Me escuchan mejor? Sí. Sí, sí, al momento está mejor. Hola. Hola, hola. 
Te escuchamos hasta el okay. 23, 27 de la, del plan de manejo. Okay. Del plan Les de contaba manejo. que el área protegida se encuentra en... Se encuentra en... Ok. Ok. El área protegida entonces está en la actualización del plan de manejo, la cual es la carta de navegación del área protegida. Eh, dentro de su componente diagnóstico hay un apartado que es el de evaluación del, de la gestión de, del área protegida. Eh, dentro de ese componente es muy útil incorporar eh, el análisis de diagnóstico de gestión de ERSAT, eh, porque pues permite tener una visión diferente de lo que después de la capacitación el 26 de junio recibí, hicimos una socialización del, del evento en el área protegida eh, y posteriormente pudimos realizar el ejercicio el 9 de agosto con miras a la actualización de, del área protegida. Eh, como resultados podemos decir que hemos identificado unas fortalezas y unas oportunidades de mejora. Dentro de las fortalezas está que el área protegida formaliza compromisos de orden nacional e internacional. Además, tenemos la capacidad para incorporar las lecciones aprendidas. Y como oportunidad de mejora, esta herramienta nos ha permitido identificar que eh, debemos mejorar en la participación en decisiones locales. Eh, esta herramienta enfatiza mucho en el concepto de región para la conservación con enfoque de resiliencia. Entonces, en el marco de la región, es necesario que nosotros, como área protegida, mejoremos o tengamos una mayor incidencia en las decisiones locales. Adicionalmente, eh, es necesario mejorar la capacidad de participación, de preparación y de recuperación. Eh, eh, por ejemplo, ahorita que estamos en el fenómeno del niño, que tenemos unos efectos sobre los ecosistemas de arrecifes de coral, es necesario que el área protegida pueda desarrollar estrategias que permitan mitigar o prepararnos para recuperar el ecosistema una vez ha pasado el efecto eh, que afecta este ecosistema. Entonces, a manera de, de conclusión, nos parece que la herramienta es una herramienta muy práctica. Eh, la pudimos correr en el lapso de cuatro horas validando constantemente, entonces eh, por eso es que hay preguntas que pueden ser similares en diferentes apartados de la herramienta, pero entonces lo que hace es validar la, la información y la coherencia para un mejor diagnóstico. Muchas gracias. Gracias, Rodrigo. <coughs> bueno, Uh, Rodrigo, entonces, uh, trabaja en la gestión del Parque Nacional de Gorgona en Colombia, en la parte de Pacífico, y hablaba como uh, después de... Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, yes. sorry. <laughs> yes, thank you, Lily. <laughs> so, so, Rodrigo is manager of the Gorgona National Park in the Pacific side of Colombia, and uh, he was talking about how after the training that he did, Uh, with his colleagues from Colombia in June, um, they actually did an, an exercise in August as part of the um, actualization, updating of the management plan in the in the MPA. They have to. They were they were working for the 23, 27 update on the plan, and then they are used to they they use the tool for that. So, uh, in applying that. Um, they were able to uh, identify some strong points and some weak points where they had to develop for better resilience in the future. So he's, he mentions that, for instance, that they have a very a good score. They had a good score for form, uh, formalized partnerships and also to a capacity of incorporating lessons learned. On the other hand, they identified some weaknesses, such as the need to incorporate um, to be incorporated uh, in local decisions more, and uh, also for the recover capacity of the area in face of events such as El Niño uh, on the coral reefs. 
So um, he was talking that he considers very useful to incorporate the tool um, for a different vision uh, and uh, that this, uh, yeah, he considers it to be very practical and um, an assessment that can be um, redone uh, periodically to, to reevaluate uh, the situation. Thank you very much, uh, Rodrigo. Thank you very much, uh, Liliane. So uh, we have uh, uh, the last uh, speaker, uh, Colonel Sidibe. Uh, Colonel Sidibe is a director of uh, Community-Based Marine Protected Areas Directorate in Senegal. And I would like to highlight that this model of Community-Based Marine Protected Area is really very interesting and could be considered as a good practice regarding resilience. Uh, Colonel? Bonjour, ou bonsoir par rapport à l'heure, quoi, que ça fait chez qui? C'est vous? Oui. Ça me fait un grand plaisir quand même de participer à ce panel qui est extrêmement important pour la direction des aires marines communautaires protégées. Parce qu'au début... Euh, on avait pensé à l'utilisation de cet outil euh, et c'était à une échelle très réduite parce qu'on on, on, n'avait pas encore eu confiance d'abord de l'outil et on ne savait pas comment ça fonctionnait, etc. Mais depuis qu'on a utilisé ces, cet outil-là, le RSAT, -là, nous avons vu que ça nous a donné entière satisfaction dans la correction qu'on doit apporter dans notre manière de manager les Césaires marines protégées. Et ça a raffermi vraiment les relations directes entre les agents de l'État et les communautés. Parce que nous, nous sommes ici, dans le cadre des aires marines communautaires protégées au Sénégal, dans une gestion partagée, où l'État et les populations partagent la gestion de ces aires marines communautaires protégées. Et quand on parle de gestion partagée, c'est l'État au service maintenant des communautés et non les communautés au service de l'État. Donc, le paradigme a complètement changé. Ce qui fait que pour, pour arriver à cela, il faut à chaque fois une discussion et cet outil nous a permis d'avoir cette discussion continuelle avec les communautés. C'est dialogue permanent. Et ça, c'est extrêmement important. Et en même temps, de corriger. Et c'est pourquoi j'ai pris la décision non seulement de généraliser donc, dans l'ensemble des AMP au niveau de, du Sénégal, mais cet outil aussi va nous servir non seulement pour l'évaluation et le rapport d'étape pour euh, sur les, les aires marines protégées à, au Sénégal. C'est pourquoi l'outil est extrêmement important et on a organisé des formations pour, 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 pour appuyer les conservateurs, les, hein, pour permettre d'avoir des... des, 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 des des, des, des formateurs, des for la formation, formation des formateurs qui nous permet maintenant de mieux former l'ensemble des agents pour une meilleure utilisation de ces outils-là. Que le conservateur soit présent ou pas, chaque agent est capable d'utiliser l'outil. Et donc ça, c'est une généralisation que nous, sommes, nous allons faire et avec l'appui des partenaires parce qu'il y a l'AMP Mangrove qui nous a beaucoup appuyé pour vraiment euh, arriver à cette, cette situation-là. Et on va continuer, Inch'Allah, à mieux utiliser cet outil-là parce que c'est un outil qui est extrêmement important et qui nous permet de corriger au fur et à mesure que nous avançons dans la gestion des aires protégées l'ensemble des erreurs que nous constatons. C'est vraiment ce, ce que je voulais dire en attendant. Peut-être que s'il y a des questions, je vais m'apprêter à répondre à ces questions-là. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup, colonel. I would like to, uh, to remind... Uh, or to highlight that uh, the Senegal has been a pilot uh, for applying in applying uh, ERSAT tool and uh, really it has been very helpful to work with uh, the, the direction. Uh, Mathieu, please could you translate briefly? Okay, so um... Colonel Mamadou Sidibe is the, the head of um, the Community-Based Marine Protected Areas Directorate uh, at the Ministry of Environment and Ecological Transition. Um, 
it's a particularity in Senegal. The government has found a, a new status, a new system of recognition of the community processes uh, and, and implication to, to foster good governance and good management of their own territories and, uh, and, and living resources. So uh, there is a very, a very strong commitment of, uh, of the, the communities who, who have required from the government support to uh, officially create now uh, more than 16 community-based MPA, MPA in, in the country, which represent more than 25% of the, of the coastline in the country and a, a good percentage of the, the inland waters. And uh, ERSAT is uh, a very interesting tool for uh, for this type of um, uh, of MPA, which is uh, obviously based on the good collaboration between the, the stakeholders, the community, the representatives, the different economic uh, actors, and and the representatives of the uh, of the government. So now ERSAT has been uh, um, ERSAT has been. Um, uh, adopted as one of the the official tools of the the national toolkit for the the good management and good governance of the MPA national uh, network, and Senegal is trying also to to promote its uh, use and development among the West African MPAs network, uh, including through its implementation in a transboundary. Uh, biosphere reserve, uh, which is shared with Mauritania, and where it appears to also be uh, a tool uh, pro peace uh, between the, the populations and, and, and neighboring countries. I hope that I captured most of the ideas developed by, by Colonel Mamadou Sidibe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for this uh, very nice translation. And very complete translation. So we are at the end of the presentation. It has been a little bit long, but uh, we have a lot of speakers, a lot of experience to share. Still, I had some other video sent by other managers, but uh, we it's it's necessary to keep time uh, to save time for the question for some questions. So thank you very much uh, to all the participants, to all the speakers. And uh, Sarah, I give you the, the floor. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you to everyone for these presentations. It's amazing how uh, to have people from all over the world presenting on our set. So it was wonderful that everyone was able to be gathered here today. Um, so we only have one question right now, and I wanted to let everyone know if they wanted to send in any additional questions, you can by putting them in the chat or the Q and A. Um, there was a question that comes in from Landisoa Rendimibison. Thanks to all for the presentation. I am Landisoa, an MPA manager in Madagascar of Nozi Tenekeli National Park. I hope I'm, I'm sort of getting the pronunciation correct. We use IMET for the evaluation of the management effici efficiency of an MPA currently. If we want to apply RSAT, how do we do that? Is the tool easy to apply? What, what are the strong points of the tool? Uh, is, um, I can respond that uh, it is one of the strengths of the tool, that it is quite easy to apply and very, very fast, very easy and user-friendly, but sometimes, we have been facing some issues with uh, formulation of the questions uh, because we, it's difficult to translate some questions between different languages because their SAT exists in four languages. But generally, it's very easy to, to use. Uh, I've seen that uh, we have some, uh, some two questions that are uh, still open, and it will be very easy to, to respond to these uh, questions. Uh, first, uh, one question from uh, Lisa Mulcahy. Uh, no, we have we have not been we, we didn't uh, go and over the tool in detail during the presentation uh, because this presentation was more dedicated to lessons learned and uh, feedbacks from the managers. Uh, but uh, if you if you are interested, 
we can we will organize other webinars until the end of this year and uh, maybe we will organize one uh, webinar justly uh, going uh, going over the tool to review uh, an overview of the tool and how it works and uh, and how to to use it but uh, we have been already doing some webinars on this topic so this is the reason why we are not more focusing on lessons learned uh, i've seen another question from uh, madagascar uh, asking uh, in Madagascar they are using uh, I don't I don't see the name of the person uh, uh, they are using the IMET uh, Landisoa uh, they are using the IMET integrating uh, management effectiveness tool uh, for assessing management effectiveness we are currently uh, in touch with uh, Carlo Paolini who has been uh, a pilot in the development of the IMET tool. And we have uh, approximately a conference in uh, Spain uh, next week. And uh, I invited uh, Carlo Paolini in order to discuss, we are already in discussion, uh, to merge and to, uh, to, um, to combine uh, RSAT and IMET. And, uh, and we will find one way in order that uh, uh, some criteria of RSAT will be added uh, and included into the IMET uh, tool. So we are justly addressing this, uh, this, this possibility. Okay, uh, thank you. Th thank you oh, very ahead. much for your question. Uh, I see one question from uh, Tim Stojanovic. Uh, Stojanovic. Uh, Tim is addressing the question of territorial integration. It's a complex concept, and it's very difficult to, to respond uh, briefly to this question. Uh, if I should have to summarize very quickly, but very quickly, <laughs> um, we could say that the territorial integration is, uh, is the existence of a kind of continuity of the use uh, inside the MPA with what happened outside. That means that there is no strong disruption into the use and the organization of the territory. For sure, surely it's very more complex. And uh, if you want uh, to know how we address this question of territorial integration, you can uh, look at the form uh, going to the platform, to the toolkit, you choose English because we are reforming the, the other language now, and uh, you try the demo option. With the demo option, you will load the, the form, and in the chapter Territorial Integration, you will uh, read the questions uh, that allow to, uh, to understand or to evaluate uh, what is the level of Territorial Integration. It is the best answer I can do. Very sorry because uh, we would be very complex and uh, time-consuming to to go more in depth. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jean-Jacques, did you see Cecile's question? The Cecile Fatbear. Yes. Uh, could you provide an example of recommendations that are generated as a total? Really, it depends totally of, uh, we have been working uh, in South America, in North America, in Europe, in Africa, in the Indian Ocean, and we are in touch with people in, the, in Southeast Asia. Really, the realities are very different and the recommendations are very different. What I can say is that the recommendations are generally very simple, easy to apply and provide results. And I would like on this, uh, on this question to give the floor to Mathieu because Mathieu has some example in Senegal where uh, simple recommendations have been providing good results very quickly. M Mathieu? Uh, yes, uh, we tried to do the exercise in Senegal uh, to formalize the analysis, uh, uh, the, the result of the analysis through uh, structured recommendation, which are addressed to um, to the, the the central directorate of MPAs, or to the managers, or to the local management committees, 
uh, it can be uh, uh, it can be formulated uh, during the during the discussions generally when you go through the evaluation you spend most of the time discussing and trying to find the good answer you know that the the evaluation form is presented as a multiple answer uh, multiple choice answer i i don't <laughs> remember the, the exact word in English that you have one question and two, three, or four different possible answers, and um, and the participants uh, go uh, uh, try to to find the the one which is the looking more like the the the, the situation that they are living, and it is generating discussions about problems that are generally not totally solved. And, and, and during this discussion, there are some ideas, some proposals and some recommendations that are formulated by the participant themselves. Um, structuring a, a full report and full recommendations from, um, uh, from an, an evaluation is, is a second exercise that you should do just after the evaluation because uh, all the ideas are are new and, and fresh in your head. And if you spend, if you wait two weeks, you will lose and, and forget about the, the the tiny ideas that are shared during the, the discussion. So it's important to go straight uh, to the recommendation. But for, I don't know, for example, very simple uh, recommendation that are generally done in Senegal, in Comoros, in Gabon, it was the same, is that the, the, the conservators are generally stuck to their job and, and not taking uh, the su sufficient time to inform the different local decision makers about what they are doing, uh, about how they make decisions and how they apply it and, and what are the, the results uh, on, on the field so that the, the mayor or the municipality or the local government of the region take consideration about the action which are undertaken by, by, by the management team. Uh, or get knowledge about uh, the, the difficulty that they meet and, and try to, to help them solving the problems on, on the field. So this idea of being daily uh, or weekly or monthly able to provide information and, and some uh, synthetical report about the activities and, and, and the problems to the, the local decision makers is something that has been adopted very quickly after the evaluation by most of the of the of the conservators of, of the MPA that were assessed and I do believe that it's going it's it's giving quite uh, um, immediate and, and positive results maybe that in in some countries certainly in developed countries people used to do that and 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 use very sound, informative tools, for example, for all the, the local government and decision makers to know what's happening on their territory. But in developing countries, such recommendations are very useful and it makes it possible to enlarge the partnerships and to get the support from the local decision makers. That's a Thank good example. Thank you very much, Mathieu. I, I would like to to add the, the one point is that in general, from my, from my experience, all recommendations are inspired directly by the questions which are in the form. Generally, when uh, we see that the score for one question is very low, uh, the formulation of the question itself can orient to some recommendations in order to improve the, the score of the response to this question. But it's, it's a general, uh, general uh, consideration. Okay, do, do we have more questions? Um, there's one more about what role does restoration play in MPAs and is this addressed by the tool? Uh, yes, it's interesting because we have seen, I, I don't know if it, it is not really a direct correlation, but we have seen that uh, many times uh, restoration is linked with other criteria. That means that uh, MPAs 
which uh, and undertake oper operation of restoration generally have a good level of understanding of uh, their environment, a good knowledge of the MPA, but especially restoration uh, impulse or stress, and, uh, I, I don't know how I can say, uh, help to improve the quality of the monitoring because when uh, restoration is undertaken, there is one investment and so they monitor what happened after the, the, the restoration operation. So uh, restoration is not, uh, we are not uh, taking restoration as a, as a very important uh, criteria for the ERSAT assessment, but we know that uh, restoration can lead to a better capacity of monitoring and uh, of uh, also knowledge management and lessons learned, especially we have seen that uh, before during the presentation, I saw, I, I show that uh, there is a, a, a link between the capacity to build lessons learned and the fact that they use uh, restoration, they practice restoration. Yeah, Jean Jacques, if I can uh, add add to that uh, as well, I think you know certainly restoration is a resilient strategy. So if you use the RSAT tool and you identify a particular vulnerability, restoration can be a strategy to enhance the resilience of that or, or reduce the the uh, impact of that particular vulnerability. So I'm thinking here of uh, again, you know, maybe um, storm surge. Uh, uh, or um, sea level rise impacts on a coastal marsh system. And so uh, an artificial reef or a shellfish reef uh, that is constructed uh, to help um, reduce wave action, uh, protect the marsh from some of these uh, impacts is a strategy that can enhance the resilience of a, uh, a marine protected area. But it's more, more or less a strategy to address uh, a vulnerability that's identified through the RSAT process. Thanks. And uh, we can add that uh, if you if you see the principle of the Society for Ecological Restoration uh, to address the cause of the degradation is a first step, obviously, but also to develop a resilience strategy for the MPA. So restoration is a component of this resilience strategy, as Mike just uh, said, and. Uh, we think really that it can help to uh, to the success and the sustainability of restoration achievements. Uh, Sarah, I don't see more questions. I don't either. No, so I think we're we're, we're good and ready to wrap up. Um, thank you so much to all of the panelists and, and presenters. It was wonderful to have you on. We're so, it was so grateful to hear about your RSAT experiences and for your sharing with others. And thank you to all of our uh, attendees. And for those who are still here, we're glad you were able to stick it out till the end to get all of the valuable learning and, and hear the answers to the questions. So um, as Jean-Jacques said, we'll, we'll look for doing um, at least one more. Um, RSAT webinar um, in the coming months. So just keep an eye out for that. And thank you all again for, for presenting today. Yes, yeah, thank you all for the richness of all these intervention and contributions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Have a good day, everyone. Okay. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.